Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Conscious Vibe Podcast, where we elevate intellect through conscious dialogue while exploring race, politics, business, and culture. I'm Dr. Daryl L. Jones, and I'm Charles D. Mitchell. Welcome to the Conscious Vibe. I got my really good friend, David Grounds, with us. I'm so excited to have you on, man. We're going to talk about everything related to you, your life. I, you, you know, the problem for me is that I know so much about you and like you growing up. I'm excited for DJ to learn more about you, but let's start with you telling us about growing up. Um, there's a lot of great things I've always heard about you and your, your childhood and sort of it's, it's shaped you in a lot of ways. So tell us what that was like growing up in the home that you had um, with your, your mom. I know Mike Dorn was a big part of your life. Tell us about that. And also your father as well. Tell us about that. Your, your biological father, I'll put it that way. So he was a, a military uh, Air Force officer. So I was, a, I was an Air Force brat for a while. Uh, and then when my parents were divorced, my mom moved my sister and I to Arizona. And so I grew up uh, with a with a single mom, working secretarial jobs, um, and she was doing everything she could to support my sister and I. Um, so I, I guess I, I grew up um, always trying to protect my sister and protect my mom. And there was nights she'd come home from work pretty distressed, and my sister and I would make costumes and try to entertain her and just be a, be a light to her as as she she did all the things that a single mom needs to do. And I can't even imagine the pressures that she was under back then, but uh, it was a perfect little family unit and it's all I knew. And uh, I'm, I'm just still grateful for those memories and, and all she did to sacrifice uh, for my sister and I. So those were fun times. Uh, and then I, I worked for a construct, I worked as a, a laborer during high school um, for a home builder and his name was Mike Dorn and he was building shopping center. And so I, I worked for him all through through high school and even even during college vacations. Um, and my responsibility slowly increased. But it was just that, you know, being on a construction site and the smells of a construction site and the, the, the fresh creosote that's been graded and seeing something being being created and built, uh, it just got into my blood. So, yeah, as a, as a young kid, I just I, I loved I loved that. And I, uh, I went to work for Apple after I graduated from, from college as an accountant. And I would sit in a cubicle every day, absolutely bored out of my mind. And I would just miss those days of working for, for Mike on the site. And then the, the coolest thing in the world happened is my mom and Mike met and they started dating and they fell in love and they ended up getting married. So it was this incredible, um, you know, love story for them. They, they ended up being married 30 years before, before she passed away a couple of years ago. But so my boss um, uh, became my stepdad. And that's the story of, of Mike Dorn. He was an incredible mentor, um, larger than life. Um, and I, I, I learned, you know, most of what I've, I've learned about, you know, business and, and leadership and being a servant to others uh, from, from him. And we started working together back in 91 and we started a little community down in green Valley together. I was the, the worker and the contractor and he was the, the money because I didn't have much. And, um, but he made me a partner, um, a sizable partner. And, and he never retraded me as things got really insane on, on the business. So I'll, I'll always look back on, on that, that there's so many people in life that if, if they're selling something, and they do really well. They can often, they can get retraded by their boss or their company. And he never, he never did that. So pretty soon I had the same amount of capital in the business that he did. And yet I was doing all the, all the work. And so it was a great way to, to grow. Um, and I, I met my, my first wife in Green Valley. That's where we were building and we raised our three kids there. And, and it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, we, we built a lot of communities down there and, during the Great Recession, when the world was ending, uh, we moved everything uh, to Prescott because we had a, an international checkpoint preventing people from easily getting to and from our subdivisions that was erected. And we had drug wars in Mexico and 
it was just like, I felt like Job sometimes because we had that plus a recession. Arizona was one of the epicenters of, of all that craziness. Um, so that, that's a little bit of the background on, on what got me into the business. And Mike, Mike long since retired. And so I've been running it for over, I don't know, 30 years. And um, I think what, what transformed us as a company was it, it became a ministry outreach, really. So we're, we're, a, we're a ministry outreach disguised as a, a home building company. And when I lived in Green Valley, I built a home for the, the, the priest in town and became really close to him, ended up becoming a, a board member of, the, of his church and really uh, became immersed in all their outreach and all the great things that that, that institution was doing for the, the less advantaged in the area. And that got into my blood and especially um, struggling moms and kids because of, of where I had come from. And so the company became a, a way for us to, to make money and then, and then give it back to the places that, that needed it the most. And that's where I just got a ton of joy and fulfillment. And the bigger our company became, the more that we could do. And, and the, the lesson for me was it's one thing to have an annual retreat with your employees and try to get them excited about, you know, here's the revenue goal and here's the profit goal and here's how many homes we're going to build. But, but it's taken me you know, 30 years to figure this out. They don't really get it that excited about those metrics. But what does get them excited is when they can volunteer to help build a home for a severely wounded veteran, or they can build a homeless lodge, or they can serve at a women and children's crisis center as a team, as a family, people get galvanized. And, and, and that made all the difference. Um, our growth exploded over the, the last 15 years because of that. And we were able to do a lot of good. And selfishly, it, it made us feel probably even better than the recipients of, of where the help went. So you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. And, and, and the people that, that were part of our team, we, we, all, we just love doing that. And uh, we've had a lot of fun. It's been meaningful. And you know, God's been great to us, for sure. So was that more or less pressure, having your stepdad as your <laughs> Manager at the scene. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm not sure. That what was it? Uh, how'd you feel about that? Yeah, you know when it was. Yeah, it's a great question. He he was always tough on me, mm-hmm. very, very tough on me, um, respectfully so. But um, I think he got harder on me when I became a stepson. You know, he, he would he would not be afraid if he if he would watch walk a job site and there was mistakes. He's like, hey, Dave, I can get anyone to do what you're doing. So if you're not going to do it right, then let's agree on this right now. And we'll we'll part ways. I mean, he could be brutal. Wow. And as a young man, when you hear that, it's just like, oh my gosh. So now he could be really tough. I try not to do that because I work with uh, my son and my daughter's boyfriend now, Augustine, and so it's like. Um, I'm repeating what he did for me. I'm, I'm doing it for other young people now. And I just try not to be quite that tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some of it was, I'm sure he saw the potential in you at the same time, right? And wanted you to live up to potential. So yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Sounds like it all worked out. You know, Dave, you, you mentioned the, 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 the priest and how, um, you know, you became a supporter of, uh, you know, the church, the parish there, but, I also know that you almost became a priest. Tell us about that. Well, I um, I wanted to be a priest. I wanted I wanted to go to seminary. I wanted it so badly, to the point where I had all the schools and and I figured out a way that I could keep the company running and still go to seminary. But you know, when you, when you marry someone, you, you know you they're, they're you know they're, in a way they're kind of they're they're buying something off of a shelf, you know, and I'm this young hustling home builder, not a priest, right? And, and as she told me, I didn't marry a priest. I'm not a preacher's wife. And um, and Dave, if you do this, it's going to have irreparable damage to our, our marriage. 
And I, I understood. I, I respected her position completely um, because that's, that's not the package that, uh, that she ended up investing in when we got married. And, and so, I don't know, people change. And I decided instead of becoming a priest, I'll just make the company my church and I'll do it a different way. And, uh, and, and that, that, that worked. I think that worked okay. Yeah, I think it has too. It's a beautiful analogy. Um, tell us what, what drives you today. Like, I know there's things that you're involved in and um, life is still evolving for you. What's, what's mo the most important things for you right now in terms of life and work and career? And, and I know this probably sounds like a cliche because you, you probably hear this from a lot of your, your guests, but maybe there's a reason why a lot of people believe in the same things. Um, but I, I, I have to have faith, right? I want to always nurture that, um, challenge it, question it, um, grow it. And then it's the family uh, and making sure that I'm providing and, and loving and protecting. And then and then it's it's really about what we create as a as a group of people. Uh, uh, Victor Shank, Victor Frankel, when there's a book, Man's Search for Meaning, and he's got this whole philosophy on what creates joy in a human being, and and one of them is to be involved in something much greater than yourself. And so, selfishly for me, it's just it's being involved in in building a company and and doing good things with it. So that's probably my, um, my third priority for sure. And then, you know, past that, it's just having great time with friends and, and family and laughing a lot, not taking myself or life too seriously, because these are crazy times, um, crazy times. And so I try to use every opportunity I can to lighten things up and have fun. So um, when we talk about Dorn Holmes, from what I read, there is a deliberate focus on smaller towns and cities. Is that still the case? And if so, um, what is it about that strategy that makes you excited? I read a book years ago called Blue Ocean Strategy. Mm -hmm. And the whole, you know, the premise, uh, the, the, the bluer the ocean, the less sharks are in it, the less blood. And so we, we intentionally sought out blue oceans and Phoenix Metro is not, not a blue ocean for what I do. I mean, every big institutional builder in the country is there. So during the last Great Recession, we looked for, for any community that was a blue ocean. And, and Prescott was a perfect one. Sedona was a perfect one. Um, uh, we, we try to find those places. Wickenburg is a great one. We're still down in Tubac in southern Arizona. And... We like it because we're staying away from the really big institutions. We can make our homes a lot more charming, uh, more historical. You know, it's if I'm in the middle of Phoenix, it's hard for me to build a Victorian cottage. I think people would be like, "What? What? It doesn't belong." But in Prescott, I can do that, and I can build farmhouses, and I can make things really th highly themed. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Disney, and we try to inject some of that that magic in the the architecture and how we design neighborhoods and even the people we employ. How many times do we um, have to deal with bad service in this day and age or grumpy people or, I don't know. So we like to have fun, high, high energy people that work with us that you know, carry that magic to the customer. And you're an award-winning company as well in terms of design um, all the accolades that uh, I know that I've come across doing homes throughout the years. Um, what are you most proud of? I mean, I know the awards are a small part of it, but what are you most proud of about the work you do? Um, we won best company to work for a few years in a row. And I, that's by far my favorite one. And um, it just means that we're, we're focused on the right, the right places. Um, so, and, and, and like you guys both know, when you're in an organization, there is always suffering that you can find. There's always somebody working for you that that's having a problem uh, medically or with their car or somebody in their family suffering. So we can all we can all help if if we just if we're present and we're awake. There's so much we can do. So we try to spoil our our employees and do a lot of crazy celebrations for the the smallest reasons. And make them feel like they're they're part of something much greater than themselves. 
Uh, you know, I, I think as a as a CEO, one of my jobs is to monitor the mood of the people when they go home at night. And if people that work uh, for our company go home at night and they're wiped out and they're stressed and they're grumpy, then I think we've failed. So if, if we can make it a fun place to work, then it's part of our job, I think. Well, that says a lot. So how big is the company? How many employees do you guys have? So right now there's 68 employees, but we subcontract like most builders, just about everything. So at any given day, there's about 1,100 people out there working, uh, creating homes and communities uh, under under our flagship. And it's a lot of responsibility. And I guarantee you there's things going wrong as, as I'm sitting here talking to you. Mistakes are happening and someone's putting a window in the wrong wall. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's never a dull moment for sure. So Dave, I know you're like someone who loves to have fun. You love you love to enjoy time with your family, and your friends. Um, what what's one of the, you know I, you know I'm leading the witness here a little bit. What is what is what is one of your favorite things to do with your family and friends when you just get out and have fun? Um, I, you're gonna you're gonna make fun of me, um, but show me somebody on a Friday night um, bar hopping in a costume, and I'll show you somebody who's having a good time. And so there's been many times where I'll, I'll go in, in Mardi Gras costume store closed down during COVID, unfortunately, but I would go in and rent like 12 Elvis costumes. Why and you buy that place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just make my friends put them on. And then, and then we go uh, bar hopping. It's, 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 it's hard not to have fun. Uh, or we've dressed up like the Avengers or, I mean, you name it, we've, we've done a lot. And, and I can say, Charles, I've seen Charles dress like Batman, oh, like Elvis. I've seen you in many costumes, my wait, friend. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Charles willingly dressed up like Elvis Presley. <laughs> he, he did. <laughs> he just said, the, the key word, the key word in your question, no, no. The key word in your, in your question there was willingly. So someone, <laughs> no, that means I was coerced. Or there was there was typically, typically there's a negotiation between Dave and I. Dave, I need pictures, man. I, I'm gonna send it, I'm gonna send them to you right after this. Yeah. But uh, Charles yeah. is Elvis. I, I mean, I, I don't even know where to start. He was the most popular Elvis that night. The most popular. Yeah, don't even start. You have you have no idea. Um, even have the he, he had like I'm gonna win this race. He had it down. He had it okay. way down. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So he was performing too. He had a little Viva Las Vegas going in there. Yeah. <laughs> so he was on stage. All right, he was. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> so, so has everyone in the world miscalculated, or is it true that Arizona is a great market for uh, new homes right now? It's incredible. Um, there's been so much growth, so much opportunity. It also comes with a little bit of peril because our costs have gone up so high. Mm -hmm. And so now when people are buying a new home, the, the problem is a lot of the big institutions are buying up a lot of the resale homes and they're using them as rental homes. So at any given time, let's say there's a thousand homes that sell in a given period of time in, on the resale market in Phoenix, a big portion of those are being sold to institutions. And when they get them, they're they're marking up those rent rates and they're they're renting them. So it's it's making it tough for people to get a starter home right now in any big city. So that's a challenge that uh, is facing our country. Um, and with interest rates starting to climb, that's gonna that's gonna you know further um, harm this whole issue of affordability. So we're we're being uh, you know, highly focused on what do we do to make homes more affordable so everybody can afford to buy one at some point. So that's that's one of the big challenges of our industry and our company right now. And, and we formed a new company called The Great Street Company, which builds cottages that you can rent. And so if things get too crazy where people can't, um, they can't get the credit to buy a new home, well, then they can rent a home and still have a garage and a driveway and a backyard and have a dog and a piece of the of the American dream. So we're, we're trying to be focused in both, both areas right now. What's that company called again? It's called the Great Street Company. And 
that was just the name was created on a whim. If you if you think about any really charming small town, most of them have a great street, you know, with the tree lines and the sidewalks and the front porches. And so this this community, each one that we build, will have that as its focal point. You'll you'll walk down a a tree lined street with front porches, and the garages are hidden behind the homes. And you look down that street, and there's an old fashioned barn and a silo, which is the clubhouse. And we're just trying to make it look like it's timeless and nostalgic. So if if we could all move to Mayberry tomorrow, it would look like one of these communities is our goal. You know, Dave, I think one of the things I really admire about you is your ability to create a picture. In other words, the, the artist in you. Um, and I know your daughter, uh, Allie Alexandra is an amazing artist, but I know that you, you leverage that in your communities. And I think that comes out in the design. It comes out in the idea of the Great Streets Company. Um, where does that come from? I mean, you, you, is that something that's always been there? So the artistry that's in there in terms of like what's inside of you or, or, or you find inspiration in other places for, the, for those things? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. We all find uh, inspiration in little things. I, I'm a huge uh, science fiction fan, and I was a great comic book fan as a kid. And just anything visual, I I love. Um, and then the whole Disney thing. I just I was I wanted to be a, a, an Imagineer. That was my my dream. Never happened. But now now we can kind of apply a lot of the the artistic elements to our homes and communities. So you, we can do a little bit of that on a small scale. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, I, I love know. movies. I love it. You know, one of the things, and I know you're a really proud dad as well. Tell us about, uh, tell us about Adam, Nick, and Allie. Tell us about your, your kids and what they're up to. Um, so Adam was, a, he's our oldest, he, he's a lacrosse player and, and he grew up in Phoenix with the rest of the kids after we moved from Green Valley. And he wanted to go back east and play lacrosse at Exeter. And I, and I was completely alien to the whole boarding school thing. Like the, the concept of kids leaving home at high school ter terrified me. Yeah. But he applied. He got in and he, uh, he went to Exeter. And then we, we kind of created a monster because then Nick wanted to go and then Allie wanted to go. So all three ended up going to school back there. And it's a lot like Hogwarts. You know, it's this magic place. Kids live uh, very independently and their friendship groups become like brotherhoods and sisterhoods. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan. And Charles, I know Jaden, Jaden's going there and is loving it. Right. So yeah. you, you've seen it. Um, and so Adam now works for the company that bought Dorn Homes because a year ago we, we sold Dorn Homes as we were embarking on the great street company. I'm still the CEO, but, um, but we sold it. And he works now for that company as their national marketing director. And then Nick works with me every day, building the, the great street communities and Allie's boyfriend, serious boyfriend. He, he also works with Nick and I, so we've got this great little family unit. Uh, never had more fun. And, uh, you know, building communities, like making movies, you know, sort of like you, you think of a script, then you got to hire all the, the the, the people, the director that, you know, got to have a producer, the whole thing. And, and you spend a couple of years of your life. Um, it's like a labor of love, creating a community. And then when you finally have that premiere, that grand opening, it either is a great success or a huge failure. So you can never really relax in this business. You're always thinking of the next script, so to speak, and putting the next team together. And, but I love it. I, I, I can't picture doing, doing anything else. So do you, um, will all of your offspring end up in some form or fashion working uh, with Dorn or they have different dreams, some of them and aspirations? Uh, yeah, Allie, Allie wants to be an artist. And, and so she paints uh, back in New York and she's okay. just, just about to graduate from, um, from her, her university. And so she's going to live back there. And then Augustine and Allie will commute back and forth so they can see each other. But that's her dream, and then I think Nick wants to wants to be a developer, and and um, and then Adam loves what he does working for the company that bought us. So I just you know I can sleep at night knowing that they're they're happy and they're they're working hard, 
and um, they're grateful you know, for what they have. So I don't know, as parents, I feel like one of our jobs is can you instill a passion in your kid? Because if they can grow up with a passion, that, that can get them through a lot of the, the trials and tribulations that kids face in this world right now. And I think they all have a passion. So I, I sleep a little easier at night. I don't think uh, I'm not convinced enough parents think about how important that is. So the fact that you're, you're saying that I think is terrific because I do think then they can start to carve out a vision for themselves once they're passionate about something. Otherwise, you know, it's easy to get lost yeah. and conform and all these other things. So I think you calling that out is really important. Well, and I don't know what, what you guys think on, on the pain that social media has, has created for our young people. But if you look at the curated lives that are shown on Facebook and, and I don't know how many, I mean, this isn't where I was thinking the conversation would go, but I was at Brophy last week attending a funeral for a young man that, that committed suicide. And, and he was the third one in a group of young men that all grew up, you know, same age, same parenting group. And when you add up the COVID isolation and then this artificial world that they have to watch from isolation of social media, and then I don't know what um, COVID, what else it's done on their, their brains, but it's just an awful time to be a young person in that regard right now. Um, I mentioned that earlier um, in another conversation. And, um, you, know, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm not on social media. Um, I, um, I just don't think it's really a healthy form uh, to really imitate what life is about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think people scroll through, you know, these lines of what people are doing and what people are experiencing. And it's all, um, you know, it's Mayberry, right? But it's not real because, you know, I think we all deal with challenges in life every single day. And we look to other people's lives as the anecdote, right? That someone's doing well and they're living their best life but something's going in a way that we all of a sudden feel like our lives aren't adequate. And so I just, and I think young people are really susceptible to that. You know, they, they, they think that, you know, they see something on social media with, you know, a group of kids and then wait a minute, they're not a part of that group, what happened? Um, and, and so, um, you know, and then tragedy strike, strikes as, as this young man who, um, you know, unfortunately uh, committed suicide recently. So um, it is a shame and I think you're right. I mean, social media has a major, major, uh, role and and how people see themselves, and I think it's just unfortunate that we aren't able to, you know, enjoy each other in a real way in life where we understand that you know none of us are perfect and that none of our lives are perfect, but it's still beautiful and that we still have a lot of love and a lot of opportunity to um, to really live full lives and enjoy it no matter what. Well said. I told you couldn't have said it better. I totally agree. It's a scary time. It is a scary time, but you know, even though it's a scary time, I think there are things that we all can be excited about. And um, you know, I love to hear what you're excited about. I know there's a lot of new things in your life. You've got you know kids who are adults now who are moving on. Allie's going to be graduating from college in a in a in a few weeks, I believe. And yeah. um, you're in a place where now you've got adult children. You're you know you're you're living what I would call your best years. What are you really excited about right now? I just came back from San Jose and there's a school there called Cristo Rey, you know, like King Christ, the, the reign of Christ. And the, the priest that I met at Santa Clara when I was going to college, he was a Jesuit priest. Um, and, and then after Santa Clara, he went to Brophy, he became the rector at Brophy. And then when he left Brophy, he started a school in, in the, the very poor part of San Jose. And it's the only kids that are, they can um, join the school for the most part, 95% of them, their parents, no one in their family has ever gone to college. And in many cases, most people in their families haven't graduated from high school. And so he started a school, he was the president and he raised the money, did the whole thing. And so I toured it with him a couple of days ago. And now he's graduating a hundred students per year and a hundred percent of them get into college. And instead of going to school five days a week, one day a week, they have to go work and they go work in the Silicon Valley. They'll work for a variety of companies and those companies pay them. But that money, instead of going to the kid, goes back to the school to help pay the school 
for the free scholarships that are offered to all these kids. And so it's an incredible program where the kids, because they're working at a, at a business one day a week, they learn, they learn technology, they learn presentations, they learn what it's like to work. So when they graduate from high school and they work all through high school, picture that like a 14 year old going to work today, mom, but, but they do. And um, it covers a big part of the budget of, of Cristo Rey. And these kids are going to, they're going everywhere, you know, from, from Duke to Stanford to Berkeley to ASU. I mean, you name it, they're all over the country, but I'm excited about that. That's, that's, um, Fernand and I are, are helping Father Paps and um, he's got a lot of people that help him in the area. But that's probably what I'm most excited about right now. That's amazing. Tell us about Fernanda. So uh, she, she, she's from Mexico. Um, from a, a large family in uh, Monterrey. See how I rolled my R's because I'm- Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's more Mexican come out of you. The, you're, you're getting there, man. I love you. Hi. Um, so we're, we're engaged to be married in late October in Mexico. And uh, I love her kids. Um, her ex-husband's a, f- a fabulous man and incredible family. And uh, my kids really think the world of her. So I was just super fortunate to meet her. And um, you know, God was great. He, he uh, he let me find her. So we're 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 having a lot of fun, and um, we we share a lot of the same values and passions, and so it's great. She's got uh, three kids still left at home, so it's it's like kind of I get I get another opportunity to uh, you know spend time at home with young kids. So it's it's like a dream. Well, that's awesome. Well, as we. Uh sort of come to a close and, and wind down. Is there anything that you think we've missed that you'd like to share with us or any questions for uh, Elvis? I'm sorry, for Charles. <laughs> <laughs> <Or myself. laughs> well, no, I, I just want to, I want to applaud both of you because it, it's an incredible podcast. I mean, from the very first episode where you interviewed Adam Goodman, you know, through Gary Linhart, through Lauren, through some incredible interviews, I mean, what you're celebrating, which is, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to tag it because I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's, it's conscious capitalism. It's, it's social justice. It's doing the right thing for the community. I mean, that's, that's desperately needed right now in society and you two are doing it. Like you're not just talking about it. You're doing it. So I, I'm just, uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like an imposter on your, on your podcast. I know like, what have I done to be on a podcast with the two of you? It's like, I have to go read a book on the imposter syndrome next, but um, no, no, seriously, you guys are, and you know, it. I mean, the people that you've had on your, on your show. Wow. It's, it's really impressive. So I, I congratulate you both on your vision and what you're doing. Oh, no, thank you. And, and I gotta tell you, like, this is, um, this is something we get to do that's really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but more than anything, I think we are really the fortunate ones because we get to have great conversations with people like you, Dave, who are doing amazing things in the world that are changing lives uh, and creating an experience that you know people that live in your communities would not have, people that work for your company would not have. Um, and I think that learning about people like you is what this podcast is all about. We want to share with the audience that is listening amazing people who are doing things in the world that they may never hear anything else about, that they don't know anything about, um, and that we can introduce to them. And uh, and at the same time, we can uh, we can elevate the conversation, right? We can elevate the conversation around these pillars that are important to us uh, about social justice, um, about culture, um, about flourishing, you know, the, the things that are important for not only just us, but also for others uh, to find meaning and success in life, whatever that may mean for them. And and do you, do you have future goals? Because you're now in, you're in year two of your podcast, right? Isn't this season two? Any particular goals that are any different than they were last year? So this will actually show up, I believe, in, in season three for us, mm-hmm. uh, which is crazy, crazy. to think about it's crazy but i've even been in arizona for three years but um yeah you know i think it, it started out with a conscious passion i think for both charles and i right we're always conscious of 
adding intellect, but still having a, a very informed perspective on things at the same time mm-hmm. and being passionate about it and having guests that sort of live and breathe what we talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we want to continue to do that. I also think at the same time uh, for us, as we start to even believe more in what we're doing, we'd love to get more eyes and ears on what we're doing at the same time. So we've talked a lot about that. What does that look like? What does that mean in terms of our format? Um, How often we do this and uh, the guests that we have on. So I think, you know, speaking personally, I think Charles and I have both talked about it. That's one of the big things for us is, you know, our visibility and who we're connecting to. We think we have a platform that could have even more, more global eyes and ears on it. So we thought a lot about that, Dave. Yeah, I think the reality is we want to do more of this, you know, and I think that we want to be able to share stories like yours with, you know, you know, as many people as we can get to hear and 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 watch what we're doing because obviously this is on uh, on video as well. So we we want that audience to be able to experience, you know, what we are able to experience in the in the personal lives that we have and that we share with others. And so we think that's really important. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Well, your, your comments are very important to us. I mean, as, as much, again, as we do this because we love it, it really matters at the end of the day when we hear uh, responses like yours about the impact that it has. That's, that really means a lot to us. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well-deserved. Well, my friend, we really appreciate you being on the show. And um, I can't wait to see you and spend some time together again. It's been way too long. Um, but um, if there's... Anything else that you have to share or want to, to say? I know DJ asked you that question, but I just want to make sure we've covered everything that, that you want to provide that uh, may be of interest to, to the people listening. Well, no, one thing I think that would be the most important of all is, Charles, if you could just r- repeat after me. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. Oh, Viva. Can you do that? Can you say it? Come on. Come on. Yeah, the show's over. I'm going to win this race. I'm going to win this race. I'm gonna win. Come on. The show is over. Uh, thank you for joining us on the content. Uh, we're completely done. Nothing else to be said. All right, you're the king. You're always going to be the king. All right, guys. All right, guys. Have a great day. Hey, be well. We'll see you soon, my friend. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us and check us out on tcvpodcast.com.